Mm. I went there last week. And Hello. All right. Ready to go. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Today we have the pleasure of Dale. Dale is a master student, for you guys who don't know him. Um, and he's nearly completing his master's thesis on paralyzation of Asian based comp uh, models in computational social science, or as Dale likes to call them, entity based models. All right. Dale. Well, thank you. All right, so f first, before I jump into um, any of the slides here, um, I just want to make a brief note on the, the research line here because this is a little bit different. Um, <laughs> Matter of fact, I'd hope that Andrew would have introduced us by saying now for something completely different <laughs> because he has the right accent for it. But that didn't happen. Um, we can start again from scratch if we like. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> but um, so, so this is the, the, there's a research line where it's about methodology in agent based modeling, individual based modeling, or as I've compressed the two into entity based models so I don't have to say all those words. Uh, so, so that's what this is. And so this started, Rob teaches an advanced agent-based model class every two years. He's teaching it this year and the fall. He'll teach it next year. If he follows the same pattern, it'll be in 2019. I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, th this, so this line of, of uh, research came out of, of that particular course. And I think it adds a, a, a crucial element to the social scientist talent stack to be able to understand how to parallelize models uh, in those situations where they get too big for running it on, on, a, on just a single standard computer. Um, and in doing this, I tried to balance the social science side and the computer science side. I probably did a lousy job because anytime you do that, you generally do a lousy job. But um, just the same, um, they're, they're wanted to have, try to do that balance because this is a social science program, but it's also a computational social science program, which means we do use computers as tools, and we should understand how the tool works, uh, understand that if, uh, you know, we know how to sho a shovel works. If you want to dig three holes at once, you can get three people and three shovels, or you can get one shovel with three shovel heads. So, but in any case, you can parallelize things. So, all right. Now, mm. now, now, there's now, a, there's now, a put, now that I put a, a smile on Bill's face, I, I don't think I weigh enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, took a lot of those three shovel heads. Oh, you, you would. I'm you have to put a lot of effort into it. <laughs> start with sand. 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 Or Got water. It. You can start with water. <laughs> so, so here was what I ended up with my research question. Now I'm going to use my fancy laser pointer here because my real laser pointer broke. Um, and so I'm using this. I can also tell you the temperature of the wall is 23 degrees centigrade. <laughs> so, so um, and, the, and, the, and the little dot probably does not show up well on, on, the, on YouTube. But So we're looking at number one here. So my, this is my first question. It was an easy question because I kind of figured I knew the answer going into it. Um, but just looking at, um, you know, how does that, how does the hardware play a role in their social scientist capability to, to really create larger scale models. And then, then secondly, uh, it's, and, and it, how does, or do, does the hardware change the approach and the skills needed for modeling? And, uh, and, and it does. And then the last one was really, this is really kind of a tacit knowledge type question. Is it worth the effort? Because you're gonna go to an effort to do this. And is it worthwhile to do this? Uh, so those are those are my three questions that, that I wanted to answer going into this. Oh, and and, and you know, feel free to ask questions anytime during this. Um, you don't have to hold it to the end. I, I know it's it's a big crowd here, but we'll try to fit all the questions in. <laughs> so, first thing I have to look at is 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 an uh, is this abstraction. So, thinking in terms of of the uh, the entity based model. Um, and I did not invent that, that term. I actually got that out of a paper out of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So somebody else invented it. Mm -hmm. And they also were combining the idea of agent-based modeling and individually based models. So we have the, at the very top here, you have your model that you've run. And that has to run on something. It's a simulation that runs on something. So there's two things it generally runs on. A general uh, EVM framework or a designed EVM framework. Now the general EVM frameworks are things uh, things like NetLogo. It would be a general EVM framework. It's designed to work with all kinds of models. Um, the designed EVM framework is going to be those situations where 
you have a particular type of problem you're trying to solve, you create a framework for solving that problem, and you're going to keep using that framework for that type of model. And I saw both of those out there in literature and past work. Um, all of these, or both of these, sit on top of some sort of general purpose programming language. Would Go the ahead. designed one be like SugarScale? No, because, well, maybe the, the original. The original, you know, the original the that came out by Packer, right? Yeah, yeah, so the maybe the original, yes. Um, these days, of course, SugarScape is done uh, in, you know, yeah, been done the, in the, everywhere. The SugarScape ABM framework. Yes. So at, at the, at the, in the, when they initially came out, in, and there weren't really any frameworks uh, when some of these were, and it's been used, yeah. to, used to solve similar types of problems where you have space and agents moving around consuming things. So, yeah. Um, so, the, um, so, in the general so we have the general purpose programming languages, and those are going to be your, your Java's, your, your C, um, um, and those types of languages where they're, they're general purpose. You can use those to make an accounting system. You can use those to program an agent-based model if you want to. Go Net ahead. logo yeah. doesn't quite fit that. No, no, net, net, I, no, net logo. I, did, did I say that? I might have started to, and I stopped because it does not fit in a general purpose program, programming yeah. language. It's it's a general EBM framework. Okay. So, um, okay, all of those sit on top of an operating system, Windows, Linux, something along those lines, and then that in turn sits on the hardware. So this is my thought of looking at this is like, all right, so I normally we're, we're sitting up at the top here at this framework. And I thought, well, all the way here at the bottom, here's the foundation. So if we change the foundation, how does that affect everything above it? And uh, so th that's why this is a hardware perspective on, on, on this type of thing. So there was, so the, the hardware is what I'm interesting, interested in. The examples I, I, I did, at least um, not really all three of them, are all sitting on top of Linux. They're all sitting on the, or some variant of it. So they're all on the same operating system. General purpose programming language that of, of the models I looked at, those all turned out to be to be different. So these are some of my considerations in programming languages. And again, this is really not about programming language, this is about hardware, but you're going to end up with some sort of programming language if you're not going to use uh, an EBM framework. So I rejected the frameworks because there's really no assurance the people who developed it took full advantage of the hardware underneath. They did what they thought was best at the time when they created that, like for instance, NetLogo. Um, but did they take full advantage of the hardware? Well, the current version of NetLogo still does not directly work with uh, multi-core CPUs. So if you want to do something with multi-core CPUs, you're going to have to take, the, um, take your model and run it several times simultaneously, um, and each one taking advantage of a CPU. It's, it, 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 it's parallel, but it's, it's, not, it's not what we're thinking of here. Um, so the programming languages also are closer to the hardware. They're sitting on top of the operating system, on top, on top of the, uh, the hardware. So um, the, the program, programming language is closer. It's easier, at least easier for me, to see how the hardware is affecting what I'm doing. Um, and then the, so the programming language, the way, when I selected it, is really first, of course, general availability. I, I mean, it, this has had to be something that anybody could download and use. You didn't have to go purchase some special uh, programming language. Um, taking into consideration the entity-based model that was to be implemented, and then how that fits on the hardware architecture. And all of this really helped me answer that third question about is it worth it to, when, you're, when you're looking at all this. Um, okay, now one other thing to mention on languages. Um, you mentioned that, that logo. So a lot of times if you're programming one of these languages, you don't realize what you're actually programming on. For instance, if you're programming in Java, you are, you're, it's what you're used to as the programmer, but you're really programming in order for the Java to be turned into Java bytecode, which in turn and runs on Java virtual machine. So the real, the real language, if you will, but you're protected from it is the Java bytecode, and the real machine you're running on is the Java virtual machine. That turns out that um, Clojure, a modern day version of Lisp, also does the same thing. It turns into Java bytecode, runs on the JVM. Um, Scala, is uh, also a more, more recent addition to the languages, and it does exactly the same thing. NetLogo, which we've mentioned, is written in Java and Scala, mostly Scala, and it in turn then runs on the JVM. So all four of these actually run on the same underlying machine, uh, but how you interact with it as a, as a modeler 
is going to be different based on the language you're using. So there's, there's little things that go on that you don't pay any attention to because it's not important to what you're doing, but it does, it does affect your, your, your model. So this is how I categorized the hardware. Um, the first one being the multi-core central processing unit. This is a CPU with, um, we've been stuck at uh, just a few cores in, uh, on the personal computers for a while. Uh, until recently when a in competitor to Intel came out with some new processors and now Intel suddenly said, oh yeah, we've had these all along here and start selling multi core or CPUs with more cores on them. So there's some now up there, almost 20 core uh, CPUs, uh, so which, is, which is nice. Um, the graphic processing unit, this started out, oh, and a word on this, GPU and GP, GPU, everyone uses those interchangeably. Um, I've tried not to, but occasionally I have, uh, just because of the context. Um, these started out, graphic processing units started out as a way to do uh, video faster on computer systems, particularly gaming systems. Uh, GPGPUs is when someone said, hey, we can use that computing power for something else, and created a general purpose use of the graphic processing units. So those are the two things you'll see. Uh, so we have, we have this, these, these are in some, but not all computers, but most computers have a, a GPU. Application specific integrated circuits. Um, those are those, those are very specialized systems. We'll talk about them later, uh, but uh, th those will change depending upon the application. You can tell by the name; it's application specific. <laughs> uh, homogeneous computing nodes, or better yet, known as uh, high performance computing clusters, these days. Um, those are the ones that are running, you know, the quote big data unquote and. Um, Amazon has these for rent, uh, uh, so does uh, Google, so does Microsoft, a few other places. So you can rent very large collections of compute, uh, computing systems to apply to problems. And then heterogeneous computing nodes, these, this is more like a distributed system. So if, you're, if you've seen something like SETI at home or folding at home, they've taken a problem, they've divided it up across the world, um, and that's crunching away on data that's been distributed to different places using spare CPU cycles on, on your computer, and then the result gets sent back up, and if you're lucky, your computer was one of the ones that made a discovery, and you'll get credit for it, in mm -hmm. official credit in a paper somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are, the, those are the five general categories. There's lots of ways to create hybrids of these. You can mix these things. You can have something multiple CPUs with a GPU unit on it. Um, there are high performance computing systems with, with ASICs and with GPUs, so, you, so, so this is not, it's not fixed boundaries between these systems, but these, this is the general categories. Um, in my presentation here and in, in, in my thesis, I did not worry about number one here because it's been done quite a bit by a lot of, a lot of people uh, have, have explored the multi-course central pr process unit, and I did not explore the last one here because frankly, uh, trying to find a way to set that up on an experimental level, um, I'd have to have a lot of friends around the world and I just don't. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there may have been some other ways to do it with, uh, but the grid computing and stuff, is there, it's specialized enough I couldn't find an easy entry path into that. Um, and it's, you know, generally it looks like a bad idea with agent-based modeling because you're going to have very high latency with communicating between the nodes that are all over the world. You're going to have internet level latencies. Oh, yeah. so, so it might be a bad idea. So, All right, so the model that I used, the EBM, was a ZIT model. Now, this is Andrew's favorite model, I understand. Rob keeps telling <laughs> no, me. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think he was kidding when he told me that. Yeah, I think the segregation one's my favorite. So. Oh, okay. So, uh, but it's a ZIT model, and the, the reason I, I use the ZIT model is because this is what, in the parallelization world, you would call a embarrassingly parallel problem. Mm -hmm. You can take this model, you can take the data that is, is going to be, be worked on, you can divide it up, uh, you can run the model on the, on the pieces, and then put the results back together at the end. There's no communication while the model's running, there's just the communication at the end. So this makes it a very simple thing to do. And I was going for simple here for obvious reasons. Uh, you want to start simple and work your way up. Like I got something else to do you know, later on, so start with the embarrassing parallel easy stuff first. So it's the ZIT model. This is the constrained version. It's, uh, there's limitations to uh, how the ZIT uh, agents will trade with each other. 
Um, and I'm, I won't go into how the ZIT model works because I hope everyone here already knows how that works. All right, now we'll get down into the individual, um, the individual pieces of hardware. So, first thing I'll be talking about is the, is the general purpose graphic processing unit. Now, this is, uh, in order to make sure that I isolated these systems as much as possible, um, I purchased uh, I purchased hardware for each of these. Well, uh, two out of the three. I wasn't going to buy a high-performance computing cluster. <laughs> um, so this is the NVIDIA Jetson TX1 development kit. It's inexpensive. Uh, it's $600 unless you're a student, and it's $300. So that's a nice price. Uh, you get you get the 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 basically the main board of the computer, and then the, the GPU is here in the center with the fan on top of it and the, the heat sink. Uh, there's a camera on board here that it comes with. Um, there's a place back here you can put Wi-Fi antennas. There's Ethernet. I mean, it's, it's a full computer. Uh, the main processor on this is an ARM processor, so pretty much like what's in phones, Raspberry Pi, that type of thing. Um, and uh, there's, uh, in terms of software, there's full software. It comes with Linux already on it. You download the latest version of the uh, programming environment for the hardware, and uh, which is which is the CUDA environment. And you um, and, and from there you can you can start writing parallel um, programs using the GPU. So this is this is a nice a nice setup I thought um, for doing this. I have I had full control over the hardware. Uh, Linux did minimally what Linux does, and I didn't ask it to do anything more than that. Uh, so uh, no, no overhead of, um, of having a, a GUI on it or anything like that. So it's just uh, command line SSH into it um, and uh, set up the programs or ran them from there. Um, there's a, th this is the TX1. There's a TX2 now available. So it's just s same board, better GPU. So how's this different? Well, the CPU, you've got multiple cores here, but not a lot of them. And these multiple cores sit on a board with lots of memory, uh, and they're fully functional uh, uh, computing units. Uh, they can run the gamut of all the things that you find in today's software world. The GPU, you have thousands of cores. Uh, each one of those is a, is a computational unit, but there's not very much memory on here compared to the CPU. So limited memory, lots of cores on the GPU. The CPU, a few cores, but lots of memory. Uh, and these are not fully capable in the sense that they can't do, com computationally, they can't do everything that a, that a CPU will do. So you have, to, you have to look at how you're going to uh, you know, set up your program. So when I did this with the ZIT model, I took Rob Axtell's model, um, which uh, he had done for um, the, a, a multi-core CPU, and uh, it was written in C, and um, it was not exactly a straight port over, but fairly close, and was able to bring it over onto the onto onto this system, um, and then I could run this um, on on the uh, on the GPU cores. Now, what it took to do this, you can't just put the program on and say, okay, make use of the GPU, because it doesn't know it's there. Everything's running on the CPUs until you tell it. So there's this, there's a, there's this environment called CUDA, the programming environment for the GPUs. You then take, you, you have to prep the amount of memory that you're going to be using. You have to move the code and the chunk of memory over from the CPU over to the GPU. Um, you have to then run your code there and wait and when it's done, it moves the results back from the GPU to the CPU, and then you can do something with it. Uh, and then you would do this over and over again. If you were doing um, something with um, that w was was running a um, you know a, pro a main programming uh, or main program that was running in a loop, you might uh, do this several times. Found out a couple things along this. For instance, the um, there's some things which you find in the in the language and see on CPUs that does not exist on the GPUs. For instance, you need to generate random numbers. And you cannot use the CPU functions on the GPU because, well, it's on the GPU. You can't tell them ahead of time to generate the random. I suppose you can generate random numbers ahead of time and send them over. But if you want random numbers generated on this side, you have to use a different random number generator. So I had to be with two random number generators on here, both allegedly using the same algorithm, but they're two different ones. So you're going to end up with some nuances like that. Um, 
managing the memory back and forth was a lot harder in the older days. By that I mean about, I don't know, two, three years ago. Um, and these days, um, they, they've actually come up with some, soft, so, some uh, modules so that um, you can uh, set up memory here and the software, the compiler knows to, how to manage and move things back and forth, a, a universal memory concept between the CPU and the GPU. So they are, have made things a little bit easier for, for, for the programmer. Um, so that's just the, the differences with the, um, with, between the physical hardware. Some of the way it's set up on the GPU, you have threads. Now, the idea of thread as a general concept is the same, but it changes in its physical manifestation. If you're on a CPU and, and like you're using Rob's program and you're running threads, you might have four cores on there, so it's four logical processing elements, and you can maybe run you know, a couple thousand threads on that, the CPU handles each one, these are software threads. In this case, though, these are hardware threads, so each one of these, each thread is a single logical processing element on the GPU. Remember, it's got, it's, it, has, it can have thousands on there. So each one of these things is set up as its own thread, it has its own memory set aside for it, they work in blocks. And the block itself has its own memory, so the threads can talk among themselves and exchange information. These blocks end up on a grid, and the grid, uh, the blocks can talk amongst themselves by going out to global memory, exchanging information. So you've got these different levels here of memory. And so you have to, you have to work around that depending on how much, uh, how much memory your, your program's gonna take. The ZIT model didn't take that much. Uh, is a pretty much able to, to, to avoid having to do anything with this and re really worked at, at this level and made it, made it fairly easy. But if, if, it Go ahead. Took, if it did take a lot of memory, would that change the results? In yeah, because of, what one's better it would fail oh. <laughs> in okay. that sense, yes. <laughs> um, so one of, one of the things, I never ran out of, 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 of processing power on the GPUs, but I did run out of memory. And, yeah. and I knew I ran out of memory because I got a really nasty error and, and uh, said I was out of memory. So, <laughs> so, so, and you'll see later on where some of my limitations were on in, in terms of scaling up, where I ran into some, some problems. Um, there's also other little limitations, like for instance, it turns out in the way NVIDIA implements this, threads should, should work in blocks of 32. Um, it's, it's, so it's a parameter in the board. When you first run the program, you read information from the board. It comes back and says m block size 32. They're all block size 32, but they've set it up so one day they can be block size. I assume 64 would be next. This is a wild guess. Um, but um, the, but uh, and, and you can work outside of that if you want to, but it's not considered efficient for doing computing on the GPU. So this did make, make some changes for me. When I, when I would do set up, say, run a 1,000 agents, um, I looked at the 1,000 agents and said, is this divisible by 32 and evenly? And if it's not, reduce the number of threads down to something divisible by 32, just to maintain the, the common practice they have in the GPU world of working in block size of 32. So there were some little differences like that. I don't think it made that much difference. Uh, in, and while I could have actually just stuck to 1,000, I tried it, I didn't see much of a difference, but best practices were to do it in blocks of 32. So let's take a look at some results. So I ran this from <clears throat> one thread uh, up to uh, 10 to the six threads, um, and then also from 10 to the third agents to 10 to the six agents. Uh, every, 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 I did 30 runs for each, each intersection of these two, uh, so I could uh, av average the results out. And um, of course, um, you can see, you can see, you can see the, the, the amount of time it's taken. This is all in milliseconds, so the amount of time it takes. This runs pretty fast on a GPU. Um, even, you know, t the one agent, and here by the way, I did break the rule about everything being divisible by 32. Um, Broke it, broke it for here, broke it for here because you know I'm not. I, I have to stick with. I, I have to run something. Uh, but then once I got up to you know 10 to the second power, then I could I could modify things a little bit. 
so um, so we ran, ran this you can see you can see how it as, as you scale up you can see how, how long how much longer it takes um, like I said though compared to the other ones even though this wasn't supposed to be a speed comparison in my mind between the different pieces of hardware th this was the best this this really ran well ran fast um, and um, it would be it would be something worth worthwhile looking at if you're running a larger model to look at this graphically because it's you know looking at numbers is the chart's a little hard. Um, you can see how it's how it scaled. Now this is using a speed multiplier. They also, it's also called speed up in some books. Um, and I've gone back and forth, and I have to admit, and still haven't quite reconciled that particular issue. Although I'm, I, I like speed multiplier, I think it's more accurate. But speed up is more popular. Um, you basic it, Bill, when you're reading it. Yeah, thing. yeah, Bill, when you're reading my thesis, go, aha, it's a red pen right there. Okay. Um, so mm -hmm. you, you look, what you do is you look at what, what is the speed, how many milliseconds does it take at the, at, the, at the lowest number of resources, the lowest number of agents, so forth. Um, you find out that speed, and then as you scale up, you compare everything to that speed. And that gives you an idea of what the speed up is for, 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 for each of these. So you can see the actual number of threads I use. So instead of Instead of 100, I use 96 here. Instead of 1,000, I use 992. But as it scaled up, some of this was 10 to 3 agents was pretty much was fairly linear over the you know the one, two, three, four data points. <laughs> um, but as you as you went up in the, the the number of agents, you can see some variations in in the, the, the in the speed multiplier, and some of that has to do with um, sometimes you're running you're running more agents than there are cores on there. It'll handle that. Um, but there's, there's, there's going to be there's going to be some um, there's, there's going to be some delays in how, when it switches switches between different blocks in order to be able to run it. Um, but uh, still, de decent decent speed multiplier. You know, you're getting up to 90 times faster um, than running running it with um, running it at a, at a single thread. So it, any, it, it, go ahead. I'm tempted to say it's only two orders of magnitude faster. For the oh for this one, yeah. So, but it's it's you know it's a decent speed up compared to you know, compared to some of the uh, some of the other uh, pieces of hardware. Um, the, the last thing I'll say here about the GPUs is the, is one of the good things about this is is as a modeler you've got you're controlling all the resources here. Yeah. You have one computer, you've got one or more um, GPU boards. You can do multiple GPU board GPU boards. Uh, and you can turn off all the other programs that you may be running and, and really cut down to just just what you want to work on and you've got full control here and, and that's something that I think is useful to have when you're when you're trying to run a model I mean Rob's running his models where he's he's trying to simulate the um, all the the firms in the United States you know on a one-to-one -one basis and that's all that computer is doing um, so that's you, you really want to approach that that particular model in terms or that particular method in terms of the the software that I was running um, in the, the program writing the program all these calls out to the to the GPU it was like a function call basically from C is well integrated with C if you're using Python instead which you could have uh, then instead instead of a function call it's uh, built in the language it's going to be an API uh, but still well integrated to be able to do this. So there's a variety of languages um, that you can do this. Uh, you can use the GPU with Fortran is supported here, which makes sense for scientific uh, use of, of it because Fortran is still quite quite well used for scientific programming. Uh, there's a um, there's a there's a lot of a lot of capability here in terms of support. Uh, the company very much supports it. There's going to be a conference in DC, I think, in just a few days. AI conference and in, that in, Nvidia is either part of or putting on. Um, <clears throat> I'd know more if I was going, but I'm not. So <laughs> uh, the um, um, the the um, amount of instructional material is available not only on Nvidia's website, but there are uh, there are MOOCs out there where you can free courseware and where you can they'll teach you how to. How to how to program in, in the GPUs. Now, a lot of times that's really oriented toward video, toward pictures, that type of thing, or gaming, but everything translates across the, the, the basic skill set does. So well supported, um, well used, and probably will be around for a long time until someone invents something 
super cool that replaces this, but it's going to have to be pretty good to replace this. So the next one is a little different. So this is application-specific integrated circuit. So this is the second piece of hardware that I, I tried things out on. Now, emphasis is really on application-specific. Uh, let me give you some examples of application-specific that have been around, uh, like uh, signal processing. Um, that um, is something that you have a board with multiple components on it. We take a signal, uh, radio signal, some other kind of signal, clean up some of the noise, do some other things, pass something out the other side. Uh, they've been able to take that type of thing on a, on a board and reduce it down to a single integrated circuit and do signal processing these days. Uh, so that would be an example of something that's application specific. In uh, the gaming world, there's a physics card that was for a while, mm -hmm. uh, Phys X, I think it was. Yeah. Um, and um, all that was designed to do was to, to handle physics related calculations well for gaming. Uh, there's also the, um, in the past, you had uh, the, the first CPUs that came out, um, sequential, single CPU, did, did uh, integer math only, didn't do floating point. Well, there was a floating point calculator, which was a single chip, call it a coprocessor in, the, in that case, but still application specific, you would hand things off to that. So these have been around for a while. So, <clears throat> oh, and the last one I do want to mention is the uh, Intel Xeon Phi 60 core coprocessor. This is something that plugs into a high performance computing. And, and put 60 cores on a, on a single board. Uh, and um, basically, from Intel's description of it, you've got um, each one of those cores has the, the capability of their, uh, their original, their original uh, CPUs when they, when they started it back in the day. Uh, but because of a reduced number of transistors for that, they can fit 60, 60 of these on a chip as opposed to um, a modern day uh, CPU, which maybe they might have maybe four or eight on there. So, um, so, so there's, there's definitely, they're, they're definitely out there. Now, do you remember what, what I mean, was it a Pentium class or yeah. is it back to eighty eight six? No, Pentium class. Okay. It wasn't that far. It wasn't back far back to the computer you have. Yeah. Yes. So. <laughs> no, that's cool. He's got one of the original computers. Yeah. I mean, you know, the Babbage. No, not the Babbage. <laughs> not that far back. He put him in the child. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so this little board was nice. It was $100. Um, now, now, I've mentioned all this application-specific things. So you're thinking, maybe you're thinking, hey, wow, somebody's invented an agent-based modeling, um, you know, um, application-specific integrated circuit. No, they haven't. And I, it'd be cool if somebody did that, but they haven't. Instead, what this was was a general-purpose parallel computing system. It was a Kickstarter project. Um, the guy that... Um, that uh, put this together is hoping to start a revolution in, in uh, parallel processing so that people will be able to do this at home. In reality, um, that didn't happen. <laughs> he, was, he was ahead of his time in this. Uh, this is just going back just maybe four or five years, but uh, they, the, the, what sold were 16 core boards. Uh, they're, they made some 64 core boards, uh, which uh, unfortunately I have not been able to get my hands on. but but. This has promise. Um, he went to work actually for DARPA, where and under a DARPA project they they taped out a, a 1,024 core board. So there is interest in this type of coprocessor, uh, and or or ASIC. Um, but this particular one, like I said, it's hundred dollars. It also runs the uh, the Linux operating system on this full Linux operating system plus the supporting programs it needs to talk to the Epiphany chip which is this one which has the, uh, the 16 cores on it. So what can you do with 16 cores? We can't do a lot, but you can certainly test the idea of working on this type of thing, uh, which was the whole point. So this is, I'm showing you a 64 core um, one. The, the idea is the same, except you know, the, 16, the 16 core is just, you know, just a piece of this. And it's just easier to see on a 64 core. But the reason why these are so powerful is because you basically, each one of these, you have a little CPU, a reduced instruction set computing, so similar to what the GPUs are. Uh, but the difference is, is every one of these can talk to every, every other chip. They're on a mesh network. And a mesh network means everything talks to everything. So to exchange information between these is extraordinarily fast. Um, you also have the ability to, to uh, both read and write simultaneously, because there's actually 
three networks connecting all of these. Uh, so one of these can say, I want to exchange information with this one over here, puts that out on, on the network, and it runs over to it, puts the information over there in, in the fraction of a second. This board operates in terms of, of gigaflops, um, you know, which is um, 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 you know, a thousand, um, not a thousand, billion um, floating point operations. So a lot for a little tiny board with 16 cores on it. Um, <coughs> One of the neat things about this is this can do something called SPMD, so single program multiple data. It can also do multi multiple program multiple data and a couple other variations on this. Uh, so you can use this in many different ways. So even though this wasn't really designed for agent based modeling or IBM or EBM, <laughs> um, this was designed to be flexible enough to do what you want with it. Uh, so you can, um, there's people that have written programs on here, so one core will handle input. Uh, three other cores will do some pre-processing off the input. Uh, some of the other cores will do some further processing and one core does the output. And you can put that into a single program distributed across all 16 cores. It, the program knows what core it's on, so it knows which part of the program to run. So you've got that single program going against multiple data. Um, so one of the, I said in the last one, the GPU I'd written, I'd taken Rob's program in C and rewrote this. So I took Rob's program in C and wrote this in what I thought was the best language that was available for this at the time. I could have done this in C, uh, but there was an easier way to do this and you're trying to fit what you're doing to the model. So I actually wrote this in BASIC. So for anyone that's familiar with BASIC, that's been around for a long time, since the 60s. Um, it's actually a sub-dialect of BASIC with some additions for parallel processing. So it's called eBASIC, Epiphany BASIC. Um, it was invented um, or, or written by uh, uh, a data scientist over in, um, in um, uh, Britain, um, last name Brown, and, uh, and he, did it, he did it for fun, and he also did it because he thought it could, because it could be done and because it was a good way to have instruction on how to do parallel processing with a simple language. Uh, after I, I wrote, rewrote the model in eBasic, he then did ePython. E um, and, uh, you know, and I could have been just happy working in Python 2 in this, or I could have done it in C. So I stuck with eBasic. E eBasic was incredibly fun, incredibly easy. I barely had to do anything to write the program in this. Um, I went through Rob's program procedurally, um, translating everything over, do, handling everything as, a, as, a, as an array. Um, you throw the program out there, each core knows what part of the array it should be dealing with based on its core ID, it goes out to that section of the array, runs, runs the model against that data, so now that's where you get the single program multiple data. And from there, um, once everything's done, they wait till they all sync up with each other, uh, and they're all done, and then core zero, could be any core, but I pick core zero, um, then sends out a command saying, okay, I, you know, bring back the results to me, I'll do the final statistics and present it. So it's, it's a map reduce type of, type of uh, algorithm that's built into this language. Uh, so, a lot of power for basic. <laughs> did, you, uh, did you use a go-to? That seems interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I, I learned a long time ago after reading, going back and reading some of my programs from the, from the I'd written basic <coughs> in the 70s, that I should never use a go-to again. <laughs> Talk about spaghetti code. Um, so, what kind of results do you get out of something like this? Well, again, so now these are cores, but think of them as threads. So one through 16 threads. And you can see we've got 10 to the three agents to 10 to the fifth. Couldn't go any higher than that, ran out of memory. Each one of these cores only has 32K of memory. <laughs> So Bill's laughing because that's bringing back some good memories for Bill, and yeah. it does for me too. Uh, but 32K of memory. Uh, but still, notice something, you, you, you should be able to notice something about a pattern in the number of milliseconds on each row. As I'm scaling up here, going up by 10 by 10, the amount of time goes up approximately by 10 by 10. So each one of these, yeah, each one of these scaled up rather nicely, has the number of agents changed. So graphically, my three lines are on top of each other. And I, first I thought, all right, what did I do wrong? Because anytime you see something, you think, what did I do wrong? So I went back and ran it all again at the same result. So I was like, all right, well, must be real then. So 
In terms of the speed multiplier, as you increase the number of cores, there are some limitations. I'm curious as to what this would look like um, in a 64 core, be only because I see this tantalizing like little upswing at the end. Is that real? Is it not? I don't know. I don't have enough cores to find out. Um, but on the other hand, as the number of agents go up, speed multiplier stays the same. So that's nice scalability. That's in the terms, it's predictable scalability. Um, you're not getting some unknown out, out there. It's less than linear. Yes, it is less than linear. Um, you get into um, Amdahl's law at yeah. some point here because you are spending some time with the, the, with the, with the overhead so the uh, program does have to transfer from the, from the main, main CPUs over and um, then there is going to be some contention, even though it's a mesh network, there's sometimes going to be some contention uh, on the network. So yeah, so Amdahl's laws would probably would, would explain the, the rest of it. By the way, take Ron's class, you'll learn about Amdahl's law and how to actually do the calculation. Um, so anyway, so that was, that was the last um, uh, on, on this. Uh, again, this was something I had full control over. The board's this big. You can't see because I'm not holding my hand. It was the size of a credit card. Um, <laughs> do shy the puppets, but I'm not going to. Uh, but so it's size of a credit card. Um, and um, um, you can buy multiples of these. I have three of them. You can link them together if, if you want to. I didn't go that far, but I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea of linking them together and, um, and seeing if that changes things. You can link them together either directly, uh, which is high speed, or you can do that through uh, their, their Ethernet connections and, and link them together. So there's some more possibilities with that. We got a we got a comment on, on the YouTube stream. It says, if you want to have two application specific chip uh, for your simulations, try FPGAs. Yep. Boards yep. with pretty powerful chips cost a range of approximately one to two hundred dollars, and build hardware implementations of the agents. Matter of fact, this board has a, a floating point gate array on it, so you can reprogram the FPGA on this if you want to. That's a whole other level of programming, and you make a mistake. You're basically building circuits and software. If you make a mistake on this, you're going to brick that thing, and it's never going to run again. Uh, so good comment uh, on that, um, and certainly if you're trying to get something really specific to what you want to do, designing it yourself, the uh, FPGAs would, would, would be one of the ways you can do that. Thanks for noticing the comment. All right, so now the next one, high performance computing cluster. All right, this is not the one I used. <laughs> This is Blue Jean L out of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. I worked there at one time and I got to play with this. Uh, I went through their, their class and, and got to do some light work on it once. And so uh, um, I've been in that room. It's fun. Um, it's nice and cool. It takes a lot of cooling. There's a giant waterfall outside the building. It's not there for aesthetics. It's there to cool this whole building. So it's, it's a, a multi-story waterfall. And, um, and you've got to do something with all that heat, and they pump it out there. The, the angles here are uh, on the side here. They're sort of like the cabinets leaning. It's to help with the cooling. So no, that's, this is not what I used, but I didn't have a picture of what I used. So what I used was a, a small development system that my company has. Um, they weren't really using, using it at the time for much of anything, um, and I could pick some times when hardly anyone would be on it. Uh, and so I ran this at night, um, and there weren't, weren't a lot of overhead or over, overnight jobs or anything. I don't know about, about now. I haven't been on the system for about a year, uh, <clears throat> but um, uh, but that's the, the system that I use. And one of the problems with this is now I have lost control of the hardware. So you do not know who else is using it. You do not know what else is going on. I, there were some management tools I could kind of look to see what was going on and see what the activities were on it, um, but I could start running my, uh, my model and then in the middle of that someone could run a job real quick and cause a little, a little blip of abuse. It was only 11 data nodes, so it wasn't big. Um, <clears throat> these days you can go on Amazon, um, uh, or go to Amazon and rent as big of a cluster as you want. You do the same thing at Microsoft, same thing um, um, at, uh, at Google. And, uh, and so you can, you can rent a cluster and run this. Uh, you can also rent them with GPUs. And so there's lots of things you can do now. If, um, if go you ahead. look into those prices on, on renting those, is it the kind of thing the universities might consider doing, going to the cloud rather than having their own clusters? Um, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Yes, in that there's a lot of people have found it cost effective to go to cloud solutions, yes. and that's because you're not directly responsible for all the problems. Right. Hard drives fail all the time. Um, you know, I forgot the estimate now for that I saw it once on Google, but it was a, given the number of systems they have, number of hard drives, there's hundreds that fail every day. Um, and uh, so someone has to be responsible for replacing those, replacing all the other parts. Uh, and all that goes away if you're, if you're renting. It's like leasing a car. Yeah. You know, it, it has a problem, you take it back to the dealer and say the engine fell out and they give you another car. So, uh, so there are definitely some advantages. But you pay for all of that. Mm -hmm. But then everyone else is paying for all of that too. And so it, with, each, with each decision you have to do um, a, a cost benefit analysis. And of course they'll help you do that. Um, and reasonably honest, but with anything like that, you take it with a grain of salt. And I don't care which of the, those three vendors I mentioned, you know, their job is to sell you something, and your job is to not pay much money. So, yeah. um, Okay, so what I was using here, because it was 11 data nodes plus a few other systems that were support uh, systems, and we had a Cloudera implementation. There's lots of different implementations you can use for this. We just happen to have Cloudera. And within Cloudera, there's a lot of different um, Soft pieces of software that you can use in this environment. It was uh, it was Cloudera. It was uh, a, a Hadoop distribution for for uh, data distribution. Um, the um, um, management of the resources with, was with Yarn, uh, and um, um, and then the language I used that I put this in was Spark, and it was the a Python. Uh, implementation of Spark. There's also a Scala implementation, and I think a couple more now. Uh, but this was a uh, but but so I did this in, in PySpark uh, version 1.6. I think we're up to 2. Point something now. I don't know if we're yeah, yeah, but it's yeah, up to yeah. And something about yeah, and and and, and the, all these things I mentioned, except for Cloudera, are all open source. You can go download them um, off of uh, Apache and other places. You can set up a bunch of Raspberry Pis at home and make your own little miniature cluster if you want to mm -hmm. experience the joys of managing a, a cluster without a lot of memory <laughs> or CPU power. Uh, but um, Cloud, what Cloudera provides and other people like them provide is making sure that all these pieces of software actually play well with each other. So you're oftentimes a version or two back until they make sure that the software actually works well. Uh, and then, the, then they'll move it forward. Um, so what I did with this, uh, uh, let's see, just to quick thing on how Spark in this case is working is there's a driver for your, your program, you have jobs, um, it creates executors, executors have tasks and the tasks are your job and it goes out and runs these. Now it runs, it's running this on hardware that in this case had 24 CPUs on every, on every data node. Um, <coughs> so that became my first, my first puzzle here is it's like, well, wait a minute, I don't just have cores. I have cores plus executors. How do I do that? Because I can't just increase the number of cores and, and say, well, those are threads. I can't just call the executors threads because they ignore the cores. So I didn't end up doing what I really wanted to do, which is running across everything. What I did was instead I felt like I had to do an optimization uh, study first on what was the right mix of cores and executors. So I took a version of the um, of the ZIT model, running 10,000 agents with a thousand trades, um, and I ran it. Did a parameter sweep from one to 24 cores, and out to 44 executors. Now, why 44? Uh, well, there was 11 data nodes, so I just multiplied it by four. Seemed like a reasonable <laughs> number. It turned out to be. Um, if it didn't, I probably would have gone out further. And ran, ran it 30 times for each of these combinations and averaged, and then this is what I got in terms of speed. So the darker purple is the slower. As you can imagine, um, having one core is slow. Having one executor is one slow. But then it gets weird. <laughs> it gets weird as you go out and look across this. And I don't know how well this comes across on the YouTube, uh, but here, for instance, was six executors. No matter how many cores I had, six ex executors was slower. And I thought at first that was an anomaly, so I went back and just ran it again on that another time. Same results. So it's like, huh. Um, and you can see that there's, this di there's a diagonal here. As the, as the number of cores is increasing and the number of executors is increasing in step, where there's a, it's slower. 
Um, you can also see some little patches where they, it comes out which routinely slower. There's some slower areas up here. Not by much, but noticeably. I, I could notice that in the data and in, in this heat map show that, the, the show that the, there were some differences. So I got to looking at, well, well why is this that, that it could be? And there were no ready answers. Went out and looked to see. Quit. But it's also only over a range of two to one. Two to one in uh, time. Oh, oh, yeah. 40, Twenty-one to forty-two seconds. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's so, not. It's not huge. Right. But but if you're if you if you're saying okay I'm going to run a model much bigger than this. Right. You, can, you, can you want to pick. You don't want you don't want to pick this up no. here in the upper left-hand corner and say that's where I'm going to run my big model. And that was my fear, is I was going to pick the wrong thing. I, I went out and looked and said, well, how do you tune yeah. uh, tune this? And there's all kinds of suggestions, but it turns out it's more they're more heuristics than anything else. Yeah. They're, they're, they're suggestions. People have had experience in trying this out. But everyone has some different answers. Even even Cloudera doesn't have a precise answer on this. They've got they have good suggestions, though. So this seemed like the best way to do it. Um, so what I end up with was some observations. Oh, well, actually, let me go back one slide real quick, though, to mention. Okay, I said it was 24 cores. They're hyper-threaded. There's, 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 here's the, bound, the hyper-threading boundary. Look down here in mm -hmm. below as opposed to above. Hyper-threading makes a difference. <clears throat> in terms of the number of data nodes, here's 11 data nodes. Here's half the number of data nodes, which is six, which that's an interesting coincidence, but it may just be a coincidence. And then going out, going out further as we as we add more executors per uh, per, per data node, um, you get into this area here where it's just you're hyper-threaded. You've got a lot of executors. It's, it's not a good idea to be in the lower right-hand portion of this. So where I picked looking at the numbers was just like I, I noticed that all right. So here's some areas that were when you look at the numbers. These were best times where I've got the dash lines around it. Um, there's this box here, which are the, all the numbers here were pretty close to each other, anywhere from 10 to, 10 to 12 executors and 12 by 15 cores. And the very best one out of all this, but by fractions, of, uh, so within margin of error, was 12 executors and 14 cores. So that's what I used. So, um, and, and, I, and, I, and I used this across um, the scaling of the, of the agents. Now, what would have been nice of course, if I had done this for every scale of agents, that there is to see if maybe something changed. Um, but uh, you can imagine how long this took to run. So this is what I ended up with, with 10 to the third agents. And uh, so basically about, about 17 to 18 seconds as I scaled it up, went fairly well until I got up to 10 to the seventh, and then you know, it was a noticeable jump in the amount of time that it took. But I did get up to 10 to the 7, which I did not on the other ones. So I was able to actually run more, more agents. Um, let's see here. And graphically. So you can see the, that big jump at 10 to the 7, wow. the execution speed. So, and again, this is not speed up now, though. This is just more execution speed because I'm not doing the speed up comparison. I didn't run 10 to the 1 agents here. So. Putting all three of these side by side in a horrible graph, uh, I, I really don't like this graph, but I'm trying to display, I've got four different pieces of data, trying to display it all at once. It's always fun to do that. So threads uh, from one thread up to um, about 10 to the five threads, and then going out here, the number of agents out here along the bottom on the x-axis. The size of the circle is the execution speed. So bigger the circle, the slower it was, the more time it took. Um, and then the, the, uh, the, the blue here is um, the high performance computing. The green here is the uh, GP GPUs. And then the little ASIC down here hugging, hugging the bottom. Um, now you want, might wonder how I picked the number of threads for the HPC since I was having that problem. Um, I swagged it, and I did that by taking the number of cores times the number of executors. I got a number about 168 inside. Of it. I'm going to use that as a reasonable approximation, even though I don't really feel 100% comfortable with that. But it's the best in the circumstances for comparison. So one of the nice thing, one of the things you can get away, take away from this is the fact that the ASIC scales up 
predictably, but it's definitely hugging the bottom in terms of in terms of um, um, uh, in terms of uh, speed. The GPU, I mean, you, I'm sure you can't even see the dot along 10 to the 4 here on, on, on YouTube, but there's a dot right there, and it's a tiny little dot. Uh, but it, um, it, it ran, ran very fast. Um, but I couldn't break 10 to the 6 with the GPU, and I couldn't break 10 to the 5 agents with the ASIC. It took the uh, HPC to go up to 10 to the 7. And how do you, how do you get more resources with, with uh, HPC? You simply write more data nodes. Mm -hmm. And so there's that type of scaling to experiment with in the future is, is to say, okay, I did this with 11 data nodes. What if I did it with 1,100 data nodes and ran it? And what would it be like? And what kind of scales could I get? Dale, that looks yes. like a, a somewhat more organized Jackson Pollock. <coughs> Pardon me? What? <laughs> An organized Jackson Pollock. Ah, do you think it would be better, is it? In that point? I don't think people will pay millions of dollars for, for this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can try. Any, any explanation why the, the transition from, for the HPC from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7? As, if you, as you increase the number of agents, you're increasing the amount of memory. Spark likes to do everything in memory. Yeah. So at a certain point, if you're forcing Spark outside of memory, it's going to those slow, spinny things. Okay. And that could that could impact. So one of the things yeah. that you would want to do is uh, increase the number of data nodes so that you're using less memory per data node, or use compute uh, uh, data nodes that have more memory on them. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the data nodes have. 280, but, um, but that's also, I think, dependent on how Spark allocated yes. RAM. So. Yeah. And, um, I mean, 256 might seem like a lot, but there's some uh, uh, commodity computers out there now that have one terabyte of RAM, and there's some specialized ones that have even more. So It's very possible that that entire memory space isn't available. Correct. But it, it, it gives me hope that I can get 25 million agents running. Yes, it should. On a, on a cluster. On a cluster. You just may have to buy a bigger cluster, but... Um, University's got clusters. Okay. Plural. Okay, good. Well, One then. of which nobody else knows about. Cool, secret <laughs> cluster. So no one will know about that, especially if they're listening. Yeah, especially if they're listening. That's why I didn't name it. Okay. <laughs> we'll call it George. <laughs> okay, so my research questions. So, yeah, the correct hardware does increase the social scientist capability. I, I, I kind of knew that going in, but you know, it's good to see that there's yeah. something that sort of proves it, to, to, at least in my mind. Um, how does it change your approach? Okay, so I didn't mention that in the, the HPC, um, I, using Spark, um, I, I actually had to go to a functional programming model. Uh, mm -hmm. So like, Lisp-like, in order to, to, work, to, 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 to work that. So definitely changes. It definitely changes your, your approach and the skills you need. Um, your net logo skills will probably not serve you well in, in some of these environments. I'm sorry, Andrew. <laughs> um, um, but if you can find something that does this, SPMD, single program, multiple data, that's awesome because you write the program one time, you don't do anything special, and the only thing you tell it is if you're on this core, do this. And then you send, send them out about their business and they do it and brings everything back. Yeah. That, that, made the, uh, that made the ASIC programming very, very simple. Is it worth the effort? Probably not unless your model has exceeded the size of your computational resources, in which case, yes, and find a computer scientist to work with if it's getting really big, because that would be a good team. A uh, computer scientist that knows their role in, provide, in helping you with the parallel processing, and then, you, and then you know your role as a social scientist with, with actually doing the model design and being able to work out some of the, the differences in between those things. Um, <coughs> So, um, some future work. So, increasing the number of data nodes in the HPC clusters would be interesting. Um, using multiple GPU boards on a single host, so now you've got more GPU available on that single PC. Uh, chaining the ASIC boards together, so you increase the number of logical processing elements or cores uh, would, would be a nice exploration. And exploring the HPC clusters with installed ASIC coprocessors like that Intel um, uh, Xeon uh, Five board that I mentioned, or five board that I mentioned. Um, 
one of the things is, is this was an embarrassingly simple model. It was ZIT. Yeah, they don't talk to anyone and to each other until it's done. So what happens if you have something more complex that requires agent communication during and not just at the conclusion of the model run? This is going to make a difference um, because now you're going to have inter-process communications, you're going to have latency uh, on, on that. And then tying an agent and the environment locality to a logical processing element, minimizing data transfer across computational boundaries is something you, you do to defeat this. So, so what does this mean? Um, it basically means uh, what you really like to have is some sort of uh, agent locality automation so that you have, um, and, and for this we would turn to, to um, network science. Uh, network science, we're familiar with it from um, uh, our um, social science, um, uh, social networks and so forth, but network science is much bigger than that. So, but you can do community detection on, on anything. So if you're sitting here with agents that are talking to each other, agents that are talking to, say, patches of ground, uh, and um, as that frequency goes up the communications, they're forming a network. And you should be able to use community detection algorithms to find those communities. Once you find those communities, you want to make sure those communities are sitting on the same location where in the same memory, chunk of memory, and the same computational units. When you, f at the, and this is something you wouldn't do once, you have to do this continually as you see the model changing and the communications changing, you may have to exchange some agents, throw some agents from, you know, to a different community as communities change, but that may be one way to minimize this. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with different agents um, on different data nodes, uh, and um, when they go to exchange information, you're gonna have to wait. And um, for, and, 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 in, in computing terms, um, it may not seem like a lot of times in human terms, but in computing terms, it's going to be forever for the computers that they're wait for that information to slowly crawl across the network onto the next rack over and find the find the the, the, the blade uh, there and get onto that system. So there's so there are some things that can be done in order to uh, uh, to in order to to make these run faster on uh, on uh, these kind of computing systems. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. So I didn't have a cat video, so <laughs> just and okay. anyone has any questions? You want hard questions or easy questions? I take any questions. Is is ZIT